Hi, everyone. Thank you, Pierre, for that uh, introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our first um, real formal event for the academic year and our first High Impact Tea speaker series for the year. Uh, I'm so excited that we have Dr. John Fisher joining us today. Um, we've been wanting to showcase and feature the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital for quite some time now. So we're very excited not only that Dr. Fisher is the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, chief medical officer of the hospital, but also that he is one of our own. He is an EMBA alum. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Fisher, and I'm really excited to um, kick today off with uh, his insights about uh, a really innovative hospital that is, um, that, that's got a lot to share and, and a lot of lessons for all of us to learn about. Um, so Dr. Fisher has more than 15 years serving as a practicing emergency room physician and is an expert in the implementation of systems to streamline and modernize uh, the coordination and delivery of quality health care. Uh, as this chief medical officer, Dr. Fisher works closely with the administration, the administrative team and medical staff to further the hospital's mission uh, by establishing quality standards, providing strategic direction, facilitating communication. He's also responsible for aligning physician performance and clinical care with the hospital's goals and objectives, um, with the real goal for patients to receive the highest quality care and have the best possible patient experience. It's a really interesting hospital that we'll learn more about in terms of its uh, private-public partnership. Uh, prior to this current role, Dr. Fisher was Chief Medical Officer of Kern Health Systems in Bakersfield um, that serves more than 140,000 Medi-Cal beneficiaries. He was also a physician advisor with Executive Health Resources, uh, reviewing clinical cases for Medicare, Medicaid, and managed care compliance for hospitals across the country. Um, Dr. Fisher served in the United States Marine Corps, has an undergraduate degree from North Carolina Central University, a medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and an MBA from UCLA Anderson. And I have completely uh, abbreviated your bio. Your bio is much lengthier, much more impressive than what I've shared. Um, and we'd love to get into that during our conversation as well. So this is such a brief introduction uh, to someone that has a lot of experience to share. So uh, I'd like everyone to join me in welcoming Dr. Fisher. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you for the very gracious introduction. And thank you for abbreviating um, the bio. <laughs> Um, so to get started, we actually um, have a, a brief presentation that Dr. Fisher is going to share to give you all a little bit of an overview of the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Community Hospital, um, a little bit about the history about the area and the hospital, and um, you know some of the outcomes um, and the successes that the hospital has had so far and the types of programs uh, it implements. So I'll turn it to Dr. Fisher to, to kick that off. Thank you very much. Uh, let me do this. Well, thank you very much again for the opportunity to join you today. I'm, I'm very honored uh, to have been invited to uh, speak with you today. Uh, thank you so very much again. Um, never imagined um, while I was a, a student there at Anderson like that I would be asked to speak to um, you know, colleagues and um, you know, current students. Uh, so uh, this is a great um, and unexpected uh, privilege and honor. So again, thank you. Um, I wanted to provide a brief overview um, about the hospital, because I think um, there are a lot of unique things, not only about the hospital, but also about our community. And um, I certainly want to share some of that to provide some context, hopefully, um, as we get to some questions and answers um, for you to have that background. So I'll try to move pretty swiftly through this. Um, just a little history. Um, you know, certainly in the 1960s, you know, inequities of, you know, high unemployment, um, poor performing schools, poor living conditions, you know, it provided the fuel for social unrest in South LA. And, you know, it turns out that a simple traffic stop gone wrong in South LA provided the spark that uh, ignited the Watts riots, which we have all you know, heard about. Um, you know, a lack of health care services was also one of the conditions that led to the riots. And in response to this, a hospital was created here on the campus. Um, in 1972, the King Drew Medical Center was opened. Um, it was a massive facility providing numerous services uh, for a community that was greatly underserved and under resources. However, it was plagued by significant and numerous patient safety concerns, um, as well as other quality of care concerns, and the hospital was unfortunately forced to close. 
County leadership, however, um, being resilient as they are, um, was determined to reopen a hospital on this campus. And so what they did is that they partnered with the University of California Regents and set out to reopen a hospital on this same campus. That is the public-private partnership, as we call it, um, that set forth the reopening of the hospital, the new MLK Community Hospital. Uh, this is a simple diagram that tries to summarize what is actually a pretty complex mechanism of oversight and funding. Essentially, LA County and the UC region signed a coordination agreement. Um, to be very brief, um, LA County committed to providing the physical infrastructure and the funding necessary to open and to continue to run the hospital. And UC Regents committed to support in quality and performance improvement oversight, as well as through UCLA to provide certain clinical service lines here at the hospital. Um, and more about the funding mechanism for the maintenance of the hospital, a series of uh, funding streams were created given our significantly adverse uh, payer mix um, and the fact that we were and are essentially serving the same population that was previously uh, served by the county and the fact that we're not a county hospital, we're actually a private hospital. And um, I think we all know that um, a hospital cannot survive financially on more than 70, 75% Medi-Cal and less than 20% Medicare. Um, so a series of intergovernmental transfers like were created, uh, that's the IGT, as well as funding for indigent care to um, help make sure that the hospital was kept whole. What LA County and the UC Regents did is that they jointly appointed an independent board of directors uh, to run the hospital. And that board of directors created a not-for-profit entity, um, which is Martin Luther King uh, Community Los Angeles or MLKLA, um, and uh, then, then set forth to open the hospital. Um, that board of directors, as I mentioned, is independent. And while there is um, oversight and guidance from both UC and LA County, the board operates independently at this, I think certainly has afforded us um, a lot of latitude um, to do some of the interesting things, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so we're located in South Los Angeles, and uh, South Los Angeles is sort of defined by what we call SPA 6, or Service, Pla service Planning Area 6. And Service Planning Area is essentially just a geographic region created by the county since it's so large. There are eight SPAs, if you will, and we're located in SPA 6. And one of the benefits of this type of demarcation is that it allows the Department of Health to sort of tailor its healthcare services um, towards you know, the individuals in that specific community, because clearly what might be necessary for SPA 6 might not be necessary for SPA 4 or for SPA 3. Um, our service area, approximately 1.3 million residents in this community, um, very young community um, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, mostly Latinx and relatively impoverished. Um, again, you know, more than 60% of the residents are below the federal poverty line. Um, we're also highly represented by homeless individuals or housing insecure individuals. Um, and um, there is also very low education um, or like minimal education rather um, present in this community. And we're also um, overrepresented by chronic disease, which we'll talk about in just a few. Um, sort of one of the more um, devastating impacts of this community and the economics of this community, the poor payer status with the number of uninsured and underinsured, mostly underinsured at this point, um, is that we have a significant physician shortage. Um, to the north, south, east, and west of us, there are more than adequate numbers of physicians to care for patients. But because of our significant physician shortage, um, along with the shortage and other healthcare resources that are essential, we you know, obviously have a higher prevalence of chronic conditions and um, a higher mortality associated with those. 
So we've identified our primary and secondary service area. Um, and it's represented here by the blue and the green. Essentially more than 75% of our patients come from these highlighted areas. So this is actually within SPA 6. Um, in terms of our patient profile, this is 2019 information. Um, we saw more than 110,000 patients. And, um, you know, we were actually, the hospital was actually built to accommodate approximately 40,000 annualized ED visits. And we're seeing more than 110,000. Um, this puts us on track to be one of the busiest emergency departments in LA County. Um, you can see some of the other demographics in terms of the number of mental health patients that we treat and the number of homeless patients that we care for. This is a listing of the services that we actually provide here at the hospital, the specialties that we provide. Um, and while this list looks expansive, um, I, I'm like, I do just want to make the point that the services that we provide here are primarily um, done so to support the volume and the types of patients that present into the emergency department. Unlike a lot of hospitals where many of these service lines would be high revenue generating service lines for those organizations, based on our payer mix, based on the demographics of the community, um, that simply isn't the case here. Um, our primary goal is to care for the 110,000 plus individuals walking through the emergency department. We don't do a ton of elective surgeries. We don't do um, very many elective admissions. We, we are truly um, trying to meet the needs of individuals as they present to the emergency department with, with their uh, exacerbation of chronic disease, but also because they don't have um, adequate primary care um, to resource, uh, like as a resource in the community. Our goal, despite all this, is to provide care that is equal to or better than uh, that provided in other communities. Um, and it's, it's, it really stems from the fact that we believe that this community deserves to have the same type of care, um, the same access, the same resources, the same clinical outcomes as other communities. And so we uh, try to think outside the box and you know, we looked at this in terms of not just being a standalone hospital, but actually attempting to create a health system that could support the other providers in the community, but also fill in the gaps and provide you know, very much patient-centered, comprehensive care. Um, you know, a few things about the hospital, we're very fortunate to you know, be a newly constructed hospital. And, um, you know, the county took great efforts to make sure like the technologically um, advanced and using the most uh, up-to-date equipment and resources. Uh, we were named the 2017 uh, Most Wired Hospital, um, a designation bestowed by the American Hospital Association. Um, we have a tremendous um, and growing UCLA partnership in terms of clinical quality, performance improvement oversight, as well as um, an emerging academic partnership. We also have a strong partnership with um, some other hospitals that uh, provide tertiary service uh, for you know, those patients that require higher level of care than what we can provide here at the hospital. For instance, Miller Children's Hospital in Long Beach supports us with neonates that need to be transferred for higher level of care. We're also in the process of exploring clinical partnerships with USC and Cedars-Sinai. Um, in terms of our um, metrics, as, as far as patient experience, what we call top box um, ratings, um, we um, score very highly in the overall rating of the hospital, as well as the likelihood to recommend. And these are recommendations from patients that have been treated here at the hospital. And we're in the process of trying to create very innovative models and structures to continue to provide care across the continuum. One of the ways that we look at this is through creating a population health model. Somewhat busy slide, but just to sort of speak to linking the hospital with care that's provided in the community, both in our own medical group, as well as with our community partners, federally qualified health centers or FQHCs, as we call them, as well as other private um, practice individuals, and creating uh, networks of post-acute providers such as SNF and home health. And at its core, 
we have to focus on what we call uh, transitional care. And it's, it's essentially making sure that patients don't fall through the cracks as they transition. So a preferred network of community providers from SNFs and home health entities with whom we meet and re share resources and coordinate care um, with the patients um, have uh, quarterly meetings to discuss opportunities on how to better coordinate the care between our facilities and meet the needs of the patients. We um, work with community um, health workers and promotors to um, help patients navigate this healthcare ecosystem here in South LA. It's, 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 um, it's amazing how, how impactful simple things like knowing where the best pharmacies are and what time they close and the right bus routes to um, uh, like to navigate to get to their uh, follow-up visits, um, those things that um, are really understood by individuals from the community. So partnering with them to help us coordinate care uh, for patients. Um, one of the things that we recently started doing was participating uh, is participating in a health homes program. Uh, individuals that are in managed, uh, managed care health plans, typically there's care coordination that happens at the health plan level. Well, some of our managed Medi-Cal health plans have now endeavored to um, push that ability to do care management at the local level, which provides a lot more flexibility. It allows us to engage patients real time and coordinate follow-up visits um, and to also help to coordinate post-discharge needs as well. Um, we have a mobile van that we have been using to do health education and community outreach that we're now exploring how we could leverage that to do home visits for patients. In addition, we are about to start a pilot with one of our uh, ambulance partners called Ambulance. Um, yes, that's the actual name. Um, and um, what they'll be doing is actually doing home visits for targeted post-discharge patients, patients that we've identified with chronic disease that also have one or more other characteristics that make them at higher likelihood of a readmission. So we're actually leveraging uh, artificial intelligence to um, make some of these determinations for a system called Data Robot that we've been um, working with. Um, we also provide pretty extensive telemedicine now, um, and we have since the hospital opened, more so because of the physician shortage in the community, and yet needing to have the resources available for patients in the emergency department or that have been admitted, but that includes endocrinology, neuro, along with telestroke, um, and psychiatry. Certainly because of COVID, um, telemedicine has just really expanded, and we're also providing primary care and other specialty care via telemedicine now. One of the things that we um, are doing with the data that we aggregate from our uh, electronic health record is actually doing geospatial mapping. Um, this is an example of how we mapped uh, patients that had been treated at MLK um, for the flu during the flu season from 2018 to 2019, basically identifying the hotspots of origination. We take this information and you know, boil it down to certain characteristics, certain locations, certain census tracts even, and then we have the ability to you know, use this information. And this is an example of how we identified several housing projects. Um, there were hotspots of flu origination. And what we did um, at, um, like at the beginning, or just prior to the 2019-2020 flu season, uh, was that we partnered with Cedars and um, actually went out to these uh, housing projects to administer free flu vaccines. Now, obviously, because of COVID, we weren't able to you know, quantify the impact of this outreach. However, um, it goes without saying that, you know, this type of analysis and this type of approach at figuring out where to target resources to take care of vulnerable populations will be very uh, helpful for us once we have um, a COVID vaccine, clearly. We also do this hot spotting, as I like to call it, um, to identify um, patients that come back to the ER um, or that initially present um, with very low acuity conditions. Again, a marker that they um, don't have the access to primary care um, that, uh, that we'd like them to, um, like to have. It, this type of hotspotting helps us make business decisions and uh, come up with ideas about how to better meet the needs of the community. In this example, this just shows us, you know, looking at um, sort of best practices and industry trends, um, you know, looking to determine, you know, 
how likely a potential consumer is to adopt another type of uh, healthcare contact, if you will, or encounter, in this instance, telemedicine or telehealth. And we match that with our own patient demographics to you know, determine whether or not this is a worthwhile venture. This heat map, if you will, basically shows the intensity as uh, being related to the actual cost of providing care in the emergency department. As I mentioned, um, based on our payer mix, we actually lose money on every emergency department visit. So this heat map basically just quantifies what those losses are that have originated for patients that have originated from these various census tracts. And you know, the plan was to deploy um, telemedicine services in these specific areas to determine whether or not it is reducing the cost to provide care for these uh, patients in these respective census tracts. However, um, you know, based on COVID, uh, based on some other factors, um, like related to telemedicine, you know, being provided more broadly, we opted not to move forward with this pilot. Um, but again, this is just one of the ways like that we try to really understand our patient population, leverage technology um, to target our efforts. The other aspect of what we do is that we do focus significantly on uh, health prevention and health education. Um, know Your Basics is a program um, through which we actually provide health education either via our mobile van um, or at various health fairs. Um, and we provide information and um, perform health screenings for patients in addition to helping to connect them with uh, providers if they don't have a primary care physician. Um, we also have a barbership program where we actually educate uh, the barbers um, on various health topics. And, you know, the goal is that when they have that client in the chair and they're, you know, having casual conversations about, you know, football or, you know, whatever else like they're talking about, um, like that the barber can weave into the discussion, uh, you know, questions and, um, you know, have a conversation with their client about, you know, their health status. And, um, you know, we follow up and actually will go to certain barbershops on certain days and coordinate health screens there at the barbershop. Again, it's, you know, having a captive audience, um, there's, you know, the customers are somewhat disarmed. It's us bringing healthcare and, um, uh, and the resources to them in a very comfortable and familiar environment. Um, um, and, you know, the response has been phenomenal. Um, Lastly, I just want to touch on um, this program, this recipe for health, which is actually one of my favorite programs. Um, it uh, essentially looks at um, you know, the importance of food, in addition to exercise, um, as being uh, major contributors um, as far as health status. Um, essentially, what happens is that a physician um, identifies a patient who has a chronic condition who they believe could benefit from um, having, um, you know, healthier foods to eat. They make a referral. The social worker actually uh, uh, performs a food security survey um, and um, patients then receive vouchers for food for up to four weeks. And um, that the fresh fruits and vegetables, herbs, spices, nuts, that content is selected by our registered dietitians based on the patient's condition, um, their diagnosis, and the reason for the referral, and patients pick up their week of food um, every week for up to four weeks uh, from our own um, hospital cafeteria. They also attend nutrition and cooking classes, and this, this prescription is refilled you know, monthly um, by, by the uh, referring physician um, as long as the patient has a need and is interested in participating in the program. Um, we did look at um, a few clinical me um, like metrics, um, uh, you know, before starting um, the pilot, um, like that I'll speak to in just a moment. Um, and uh, we wanted to try to gauge the effectiveness. We um, had 236 patients uh, enroll, um, approximately 54 years of age. Um, and we um, looked at what their baseline clinical conditions and the reasons for their enrollment were. And clearly it's diabetes, uh, heart disease, obesity, or some combination of all. Um, what we looked at 
on the back end was a few things. We looked at their utilization. So what we found um, was that uh, the no-show rate for uh, following up with their physicians was approximately half that um, than uh, for patients that didn't participate in the recipe for health program. Um, and that was irrespective of whether they were going back for a refill um, for their um, uh, food. Um, they tended to follow up more. They were more engaged. They also had fewer emergency department visits uh, in comparison to the individuals that did not participate in the program. Um, they um, increased their dietary knowledge um, and uh, they all stated like that they felt that they uh, were better able to cook fresh fruits, uh, excuse me, fresh vegetables and know which fruits to consume and which ones not to based on their clinical condition um, as a result of participating in the program. They also noted that they had a decreased dependency on fast food consumption. Some minor improvements, uh, certainly, um, in some of the metrics related to their diabetic status or their high blood pressure. Uh, we still have to figure out why they were gaining weight, um, but you know, we'll, we'll sort through that one um, uh, as we do a little bit of a deeper dive. And um, more than 87% of the participants showed some improvement in something, either one of their clinical uh, health measures or in their utilization of the emergency department. And one of the sort of unmeasured, but um, uh, you know, certainly anecdotal impacts was that of the impact of the other family members when the patient would bring these uh, boxes home. Um, you know, anecdotally, like we were told, like, well, my whole family was sharing the food. So, you know, that's the only reason, like, why well, I run out a little bit sooner. Um, and, you know, one of my family members, you know, didn't even know what a squash was, but now it's one of their favorite foods. So, you know, we certainly, um, you know, would like to uh, figure out how to measure that impact. But um, just the very fact that, um, that the food is being taken home and being shared with their family is is a tremendous uh, benefit for us. Again, all these individuals were determined to be food insecure, um, you know, and not able to uh, either afford or would have access to uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. Um, um, like, I don't wanna uh, take up too much time, but I did wanna share a little bit about the organization, um, sort of what we're doing. Um, and how we're trying to make the uh, most out of this public-private partnership to meet the needs of our community. It uh, you know, stems with having great partners and great support from the county, UC, um, the other clinical partners, uh, a very solid funding mechanism um, that really uh, ensures the viability of the hospital, a very active um, fundraising foundation and a lot of philanthropic support from a lot of entities that allow us to do these other um, very exciting things um, that helps us to build this um, population health centric model uh, to provide care as it's Little Bitty Hospital in South LA. Um, so just a little bit about us and certainly um, I'm ready for questions. Thank you. That was that was fantastic and um, really, really insightful to hear about <clears throat> just the thought that's gone into um, developing kind of the holistic view from the hospital. Um, the way in terms of formats, for those of you just joining a high impact tea, I have a few questions that I'd love to ask and then uh, feel free to send in your questions via Q&A and, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so Dr. Fisher, I, I'm so excited that you ended with the uh, recipe for health program, the prescription for health, because because um, it's one of those things that um, in my very first public health class, it was one of the things that the professor said, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if, if physicians could just give everybody a prescription for walking or healthy foods or, you know, better neighborhoods and housing and things like that, which speaks to the social, the whole concept of social determinants of health. Could you speak a little bit about, you know, as a hospital, it's a very unique hospital in that you, from the get-go, the hospital seems to be envisioning, uh, you know, more of a coordination role and a community-based role than a typical hospital that is more treatment-focused, right? So what are some of the ways in which, you mentioned kind of provider shortage and all of that, what are some of the ways in which uh, MLKCH 
actually engages in some of the social determinants of health, you know, uh, housing related programs, transportation related, addressing some of these barriers to accessing health um, through partnerships, through community based models. And then, you know, the, the program you just mentioned seems like something that the LA County Public Health Department would be undertaking typically. Is that done in partnership with the health department? Um, could you speak a little bit about how the kind of social determinants of health works? Yeah, certainly. Um, so um, first off, I would just say that, um, well, I want to answer the, the last part of the question like that you just asked, which is, no, it's not done in partnership with, with, um, with the Department of Public Health. Uh, we actually, the organization actually um, uh, provides the food and uh, purchases the food that's put into the kits. Um, this, this, is, this is probably one of the few um, efforts that uh, we're kind of doing on our own. The majority of, of all the efforts are always in collaboration with other community partners. Um, we have a very active group of social workers who are engaged with many community organizations, local churches, um, other providers in the community in terms of um, other clinics, um, federal qualified health centers, as I mentioned, um, and other you know, entities, home health entities, and uh, local SNFs, uh, skilled nursing facilities, um, and um, you know, working with the uh, like with the local housing authority, um, you know, having those deep relationships and those deep partnerships really allow us to like to coordinate the care in the best possible way for patients. But even those entities are um, are strained and uh, are strapped and oftentimes under resourced, overwhelmed with the volume of work like that they have. And so what we look to do is to not add to their burden, but to try to share in that work. Um, so our staff, you know, try to do a little bit more than maybe what a traditional social worker employed at a hospital would do, um, or a case manager, um, I'm like, would do. Um, so that's kind of how we've been navigating this. I mean, certainly as a standalone hospital, we couldn't do this by ourselves. We couldn't do all of this without the partnerships that we've established in the community. And a lot of that work establishing those relationships happened before the hospital opened. Um, there was a lot of effort in terms of understanding what the needs of the community were and what and how we could augment what community providers and uh, healthcare workers were already doing, not to replace what they were doing necessarily, but to augment. Um, numerous focus groups, numerous meetings, uh, years before the hospital opened. Um, so a lot of homework, if you will. And that's actually uh, brings me to, to my, my question about, you know, in terms of you, you mentioned the history of the hospital and it was a county run hospital. And there's, you know, um, a lot of, there's a lot of historic memory of kind of the failed county hospital and it's the same site. And there was a whole rebranding that happened, but the same name um, but in the same site you know, since a lot of students are, you know, market interest in marketing and those kinds of things, how did, what was that like in terms of rebranding, reestablishing trust in the community, um, that the vision of this hospital would be different, its role in the community would be different, it would operate differently, it would provide better care, um, to kind of reverse some of the memory of kind of the tainted closed hospital from before. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so, I mean, I would say that broadly, um, the strategy was just, it was new, right? New. So a fresh start, uh, starting with a clean slate, um, you know, looking at best practices, uh, establishing certain expectations and standards for quality of care, some of which um, were, well, back then, you know, so, like several years ago, I won't say controversial, but um, we were really questioned about, you know, um, why we were making some of the decisions that we were making. For instance, um, you know, in partnership with our board, we you know, sort of set an expectation that all the physicians would have to be board certified. And that's not to say like that um, a physician isn't you know, competent and uh, qualified to care for a patient if they aren't board certified, but we just wanted to set a standard to set an expectation um, that this external validation by the specialty boards um, for all the specialties that the physicians belong to would be another way to validate their clinical competence. 
um, and understanding that most of these specialty boards also have a requirement for continuing education, meaning that, you know, the physicians would have to stay up to date on, you know, the, like evidence-based practice. So it, it, again, just created one less, I won't say one less thing we had to worry about, but certainly um, one more sort of proof point, if you will. Um, we did, I'm like, I'm like, as I mentioned, stipulate like that it is new and these are our expectations. Quality is at the center. It, it almost became, um, we talked about it so much. We preached it so much. We all drank the Kool-Aid, if you will. Um, and, you know, just said, well, we're not going to accept mediocre. We're not going to, you know, um, accept that, well, this is just the way that care is provided in South LA. It's different than how care is provided on the West side. We always said, well, why, why don't we bring the West side to the South side? And, you know, don't the patients deserve that? Um, and so that was our, that was our perspective. But I do just want to take a moment just to speak to one aspect about the old hospital. Um, you know, certainly um, it, bad things happened. Um, there were challenges. Um, the hospital, I, I truly believe, um, you know, that it wanted to do the right thing for all patients. It was a massive hospital, um, tons of patients everywhere. Um, and, you know, I'm not quite sure about the resources that it had or didn't have, but certainly um, what we found uh, during those few years before the hospital opened and talking with community members and former patients was while the healthcare community focused on, you know, all the adverse events and, um, you know, issues that the hospital had, many people in the community still clung on to um, the image of the old hospital and their experiences in the old, old hospital, sharing things like, this was the only place that would take care of me. Um, you know, they saved my cousin's life, you know, when he was shot. Um, they saved my leg. Uh, you know, I mean, so like there was a lot of fondness still for the old hospital. So, you know, more so than trying to um, do away with the Killer King, um, you know, persona, it was, well, we're taking care of the same patients, the same patient population, broadly speaking, and I'm like in this community, the demographics that I'm like have changed slightly. Um, but we're just approaching it from a new perspective and setting expectations for quality and for patient safety and um, monitoring those and not getting uh, ahead of our skis. And so in other words, not trying to be more of a hospital than what we can safely be. Um, we're not a trauma center. We don't do open heart surgery. Um, most of our patients come through the emergency department, as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority. And um, all the, the specialties that we have, again, are not really there to do complicated procedures and um, a lot of novel things that would be high revenue generating. It primarily is to stabilize and treat patients who come to the hospital. And in some cases, stabilize or transfer to higher level of care. Um, again, that mantra first do no harm right um so that's 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 sort of how we approached it um, i think i answered the question i hope yeah I did. yeah you did um and i want to i want to talk about um i have a, i have two more questions and then i know there's a ton of questions coming in so i want to make sure we have enough time for audience questions as well i want to kind of you know bring it to um COVID-19 and kind of the, the challenges. You shared that over 93% of the uh, patient demographic is Latinx and black, and majority of them are um, low income. Um, and we are learning that those are the populations that are most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. How, is, how has that been showing up for you all at the hospital? Um, and how is that, is that, is that putting a strain on your kind of physician resources, your, your existing resources? Um, how are you able to, find balance right now in terms of some of the preventive services that you offer and preventive programs, um, and then also addressing probably a disproportionately high COVID-19 uh, impact? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, oddly enough, um, our experience with COVID um, was, it was, it was somewhat expected, but in some ways unexpected. Um, we were all caught off guard with COVID and um, seeing the the impact on the East Coast and um, how rapidly um, uh, 
patient populations were becoming infected and inundating hospitals and ICUs. Um, we, we tried to wrap up extremely fast in terms of uh, protective personal equipment, uh, ensuring that we could increase our bed capacity, uh, ensuring that we had adequate staffing, uh, both in terms of you know, nursing and, and uh, health professionals as well as physicians. Um, so we did a lot of work really quickly like most organizations did. Um, early on, um, there was a significant drop in our volume like for the emergency department, I think primarily because people were afraid to come to the hospital. Um, and um, you know, again, a very high percentage of the patients that we see in the emergency department have relatively low acuity conditions. Um, and so they were just opting not to be seen by anyone. Prim I mean, like if they didn't have a primary care doctor, they weren't coming to the emergency department to be seen either. But those patients that we admitted, it was interesting uh, because at, at its peak, we basically had um, an inpatient system of census that was 50% um, either COVID or PUIs, as we call them, persons under investigation for potential COVID. Uh, they have symptoms, they're being tested, we're waiting for test results. So we're, you know, quarantining them um, or isolating them and, um, you know, providing care as though they have COVID until we know otherwise. Um, and 50% are regular, you know, medical admissions. Um, we did hit some high census days and we had some, um, you know, several days, maybe a couple of weeks, like where we had higher than um, normal ICU census, mostly related to the length of stay um, for the hospitalized patients or the patients in the ICU, not so much the, the, the uh, true percentage of patients as a percentage of our admitted patients going to the ICU. Um, but that has since dropped off significantly. So, um, and, you know, we're not quite sure if this is just the lull before the next um, sort of um, ebb in this, you know, COVID um, experience. Um, we temporarily had strained resources, but subsequently um, pivoted to a lot of telemedicine for primary care um, and, um, and for post-discharge follow-up. And that we were really surprised that patients were um, following up and making use of telemedicine visits um, at a rate that we weren't expecting. So that's been actually, I think, um, a great learning point as well, because I think that um, at one point, uh, some people were questioning whether or not this community would make use of telemedicine. Um, and they are, which is great. And you had mentioned when we talked earlier that uh, a lot of the staff are also from the community, right? So there's sort of a lot of interaction between staff and patient in terms of um, who you have in, as, as staff in the hospital. Is that is that the case? Yeah, so, um, so we have a significant uh, percentage and think, and I'm, and I'm going to mess up like the statistic, um, but I think it's somewhere around 30% um, of our, you know, staff are actually from the community, um, which is, which is a pretty significant, you know, like number, um, you know, we have numerous staff that actually, you know, live a few blocks from the hospital or their families do, um, you know, staff um, that um, you know, tell us like that they were born in the old hospital. Um, and their families still um, like receive care um, like here in the health system, which is great. Um, so I think that that does also help with, with maintaining the trust and the credibility in the community as well, right? Because we have a very diverse staff um, and um, one that is highly representative of the you know, patients and the community that we serve. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask a little bit about um, impact measurement um, before we move to audience questions. Um, and maybe, you know, because it was sort of you went through your presentation pretty quickly, I'm wondering if you could maybe describe the public private partnership model a little bit more because there are so many different ways that that can be organized. And some, some models actually require some sort of a reporting of outcome or metrics of success. Um, are there any kind of key performance indicators the hospital is under obligation to report up? And how does that work in terms of funding? Mm -hmm. So um, things, that, things that we report regularly um, to the Board of Supervisors, the LA County Board, uh, my board of Supervisors includes um, our, our admission data, um, you know, the you know, volume of patients like they're retreating in the ICU, diagnoses, the number of patients that we're seeing in the emergency department, um, we also, obviously, as a 
as a hospital. I mean, the publicly reported data is also shared, but is easily uh, accessible in terms of, you know, other quality metrics, um, you know, such as, um, um, again, like emergency department um, flow, uh, patient satisfaction, um, you know, hospital acquired infections or conditions, um, you know, other, you know, like metrics in terms of um, the types of patients like that we're seeing, uh, the diagnoses, uh, all of that data is um, either shared directly or is obviously made available um, to uh, the Board of Supervisors on a regular basis. Um, and, and it really just does sort of ensure primarily from the perspective that um, uh, our payer mix like remains um, you know, diverse and representative of the patients in the community or the individuals in the community in terms of their insurance status, uh, um, like such that we're not uh, picking and choosing which patients we're seeing, um, unlike obviously based on payer status, um, and that the emergency department continues to see patients um, that are undifferentiated that present uh, with various complaints and, our, and, and that our ICU um, is also still very active taking care of you know, truly um, ill patients. And again, I think more so from the perspective of just ensuring like that there's uh, no picking and choosing of which patients we're caring for based on their insurance status. So for us, it's never been an issue because that's, you know, our mission is to, you know, take care of the community broadly. Um, but all those metrics, like, as I mentioned, are either shared quarterly or um, made available um, in whatever uh, time frame those national um, benchmarks are assessed. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that are coming in. Um, so actually, there's a couple questions about just your role as a chief medical officer, and maybe we can turn to a question that I had in terms of just your career projection um, and your role, your day-to-day -day is the question, um, but just kind of if you can speak to your, your story and your path and kind of how you discovered um, wanting to be in this space in health where there's sort of a community drive and, and a social impact. Um, well, so um, briefly, I mean, you know, like while I was in medical school, I, I, I knew that I wanted to um, have a career that uh, was clinical and also administrative. Um, and while I was in medical school, I did an internship at the Greater New York Hospital Association, where I actually shadowed um, the uh, chief operating officer and a chief medical officer from a two hospital system in, uh, in uh, Westchester County. And um, that was sort of when I caught the bug, if you will. Um, I was like, wow, this is where the magic happens. And um, from that point, um, I knew that I wanted to pursue an MBA and thought about taking time off from school to pursue the MBA. Uh, the CEO at the hospital sat me down and you know, shared that, um, and this was excellent, um, uh, you know, this was an excellent recommendation by him, like that, well, you know, the real value like that you'll bring to your to your peers in your MBA class, as well as the value that you'll get out of the MBA subsequently will be based upon your understanding of healthcare and the real world experience that you'll have as a physician. Um, so I took that to heart. And um, you know, subsequently um, after you know, the MBA started doing some consulting work and realized that um, you know, the reasons that I went into medicine, which was to make a difference and to impact lives, um, I really wanted to be able to figure out how to scale that such that it wasn't just one patient at a time that I'm seeing in the emergency room. Um, and so I looked for opportunities in the not-for-profit sector, um, primarily leadership roles, either in, um, you know, the health insurance area, like the not-for-profit, so sort of Medi-Cal healthcare insurance um, um, region, but then also on the provider side and it landed on the hospital side. Uh, my day-to-day -day, um, contract negotiations with physician and provider groups uh, oversee quality and patient safety at the hospital. Um, uh, I'm also um, helping to put together our research infrastructure so that we can participate in some of these clinical trials, potentially um, like related to COVID, to ensure that our community has access to the medications when they become available um, and the vaccines not going to become available. And we're also um, putting in place our graduate medical education program. So I serve as the individual with oversight over that. That's wonderful. Um, so, okay, so this question is about, um, in terms of the, you know, 110,000 plus emergency room visits that you talked about annually, um, and 
already kind of working on more upstream preventive programs like, you know, Man Up and all of that. Are there other plans to continue to work on more preventive programs and, and move upstream to address, you know, kind of the volume of emergency room visits that you're getting? Yeah, and um, I would say like that, you know, primarily, and and I didn't really speak to this much though, um, I think it was present like on one of the slides, um, MLK CMG or MLK Community Medical Group, we actually created um, our own medical group. And so we've been in the process of recruiting physicians um, and hiring physicians to practice here in South LA. One of the biggest challenges the majority of the physicians on staff here have is that they provide like what we call call coverage for the emergency department, but they don't have a practice in this community. So patients can't follow up with them after they get discharged. And patients oftentimes can't get the routine uh, primary and specialty care that, um, like that they need to prevent them from actually developing a condition that lands them in the emergency department. So we have created our own medical group, which we um, recently transitioned to a medical foundation and it's multi-specialty. Um, we have plans to grow the group and with the assistance of uh, philanthropy, um, we you know, have a plan to, to have as many as 40 uh, full-time equivalent um, like physicians in that medical group, multi-specialty, uh, to provide services. And we now have three clinic locations um, uh, nestled around the hospital. And we have dietitians, we have clinical pharmacists, um, we have social workers, we have health navigators, uh, we have RNs in that clinic working side by side with the physicians. In addition, we recently hired um, a clinical psychologist uh, because we um, have become very much aware of the intersection, in addition to food, but the intersection between medicine and behavioral health as it relates to how well a patient can navigate and participate in their own health care, both in a preventive um, nature as well as sort of a rescue um, like nature once they've been admitted in the hospital. Um, so that's some of what we're doing to sort of build out the infrastructure, if you will, to manage uh, an entire population. That's great. And that was actually another question about partnerships to address mental health issues, increasing with the younger generation um, and um, you know, existing partnerships that you have with other organizations that already do that. And also just if you could expand on maybe some of the intersectionality that has shown up this year in particular with not only your, your patient population, but the staff as well in terms of the added stressors of, you know, being brought to the spotlight, um, the national conversation on, on systemic racism. And how is that, how is that, how is the hospital kind of being the community hub to support those conversations too? Great question. So um, we are in the process of creating um, our integrated behavioral health uh, program. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the clinical psychologists we, we have recently brought on, but we also have uh, licensed clinical social workers, and we're building out that infrastructure. We have um, psychiatrists, um, one of whom uh, is actually also uh, boarded in addiction psychiatry. We also have a family medicine physician who is boarded in addiction medicine. Um, and, you know, putting together this comprehensive program that, um, you know, becomes uh, sort of this space where patients can be seen um, in the hospital and then safely transition with a warm handoff into that infrastructure on the outpatient side. Um, certainly, um, one of the things that we recognized was a significant challenge that patients being discharged from the hospital and their families, you know, have related to COVID. Um, one of the things that we set up was a multidisciplinary uh, post, uh, post-COVID, if you will, or post-ICU clinic um, that um, also has the behavioral health components as well as the medical components to help be there um, you know, to provide that totality of care for patients as they transition out. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, the broader challenges like that we've seen, um, like related to uh, the social injustice, um, in terms, you know, with the with the uh, with the marches and um, with the uh, protesting, um, I think that you know our our position as as an organization that has been committed to the community hasn't changed. Um, you know, it's interesting that um, a lot of corporate um, entities are coming out with new statements or statements, um, you know, sort of 
affirming like their commitment to diversity and to social justice. Um, I think that that's been our statement since the beginning. And, um, you know, we've been, I think, living it, um, you know, through the demonstration of the programs and the care that we're providing for the community. Um, and, you know, our staff has had uh, forums to sort of talk through and um, share their concerns and share their experiences in a constructive and safe, you know, space. Um, but I mean, I think that that's kind of us, you know, just needing to, you know, in addition to providing those forums, but just continuing to do the work that we're doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and does that show up in, in kind of your commitment to diversity and leadership at the hospital as well? Yeah, I mean, certainly so. I, I mean, you know, we, we, we have always maintained like that we want to ensure that uh, we, you know, not only have the best and brightest, but we have the best and brightest that uh, really understands the community and is passionate about serving the community and to the extent possible is representative of the community as well. Um, and that's been a sort of unfaltering sort of priority of the organization. Um, I have one last question that actually is probably will resonate with a lot of people and, and what you spoke to in terms of just the, the, the level of success the hospital has been able to achieve in terms of quality of care. Um, how do you ensure that the partners that you work with, whether it's home care, SNF, meet your standard in terms of quality, in terms of quality of care and continuum of care? What is your selection process like for your partners? That's a great question. So um, like the hospital, um, many of these um, post-acute providers also um, have um, publicly reported um, safety and quality um, scores that um, we're able to, um, you know, to, you know, like to um, obtain. And so um, one of the, you know, like metrics is, well, how are their quality scores? Um, what, like for instance, uh, a skilled nursing facility, um, uh, you know, how frequently does a patient unfortunately develop um, a condition related to uh, Foley catheter or some other peripheral line um, like that they have that becomes a complication and they have to go back to the hospital. Um, how frequently does a patient in one of these facilities develop uh, a, a bed sore that, um, you know, they now have to go to the hospital and have taken care of, um, or even not have to come back to the hospital. But, but like this is, in many instances, publicly reported data. So we look at the data and we see who's performing well, because again, we are referring our patients to those facilities. And, um, you know, our patients are entrusting us to, you know, um, make recommendations uh, for them that, you know, we would want to make for ourselves. And, you know, that's the list to which we look at this. Now, what we do, though, is that we partner with those organizations and where they may have challenges, we attempt to, you know, support and, you know, work with them to help bring up this, you know, like their scores at the same time. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we did just recently, um, as we were able to amass enough PPE to safely, you know, um, yeah, like provide care um, here at the hospitals, that we started sharing PPE with some of our, um, you know, uh, partners in the community um, so that they would be able to, um, you know, protect their staff as well. So it, it's, it's, and, and our patients as we transition to their facilities, right? Um, so, I mean, that's sort of how we kind of take this holistic approach at, you know, the partnerships. It's uh, vetting them, but then also working with them to improve where they may have challenges. We meet quarterly, we discuss um, opportunities. Um, we um, also help uh, like provide in services, like some training for their staff, like if it's necessary. And, and then we share resources. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And um, we're over time, but I just want to ask a closing question. And, and, you know, there's so much to unpack here and I wish we had longer um, an hour is so short in our virtual world, but I, I do want to ask you a, a general question in, in closing in terms of advice for those that are still on and are going to be watching this later. Um, you know, you know that Impact at Anderson is the center focused on kind of addressing and bridging the world of business and social impact and recognizing what business and private sector can do for um, social outcome improvement. What do you believe your role, the role of an MBA, if any, is in addressing some of these grand societal, um, you know, intractable problems that we see? Um, can you speak to that for as, as form of advice for anybody on that thinking about going to careers in those areas? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, like, I think that it um, really centers around looking for opportunities to leverage um, your, um, like, your business acumen and expertise in a way that will benefit, um, you know, individuals that are disadvantaged or that are significantly impacted by, you know, these social inequities. Um, so, you know, most of, I won't say most of, but many of the challenges um, do have a financial undergirding, right? Um, like as part of the um, issue or one of the core contributors and um, understanding, you know, the business perspectives of, you know, entities that have the ability to make a positive impact and how do you convince those entities like that um, this is the right thing to do or look for solutions where they can do the right thing and still be, um, you know, you know, financially sound or not financially disadvantaged, thinking outside of the box, being willing to, you know, pilot and demonstrate effectiveness um, and, you know, have those, you know, persuasive conversations with the key decision makers. I mean, it's, 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 it's about leveraging all of that, you know, um, I mean, I, I can go on and on about little um, things that I remember from certain courses there and like UCLA and I, and ooh, I used that, that really worked, um, you know, just, 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 just like the numerous, um, uh, you know, nuggets like that I gained. And so I would say one, you know, always be looking for those opportunities, um, be willing to think outside of the box. Um, you know, one of the questions that I always ask is why not? You know, it's not, you know, like someone will, you know, come to me and say, well, can we do X, Y, Z? And, you know, I don't say why. I'm like, okay, well, why not? You know, let's, 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 let's try it. Um, and so be, you know, like being willing to experiment um, and, you know, fail forward, um, if you will. Um, and I think that just kind of sums it up, you know, yeah, that's fantastic. the way I look at it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you, Dr. Fisher. Um, there are some of your uh, EMBA alumni, are, you, you can check the, the Q&A in the chat later, are saying hello to you. But thank you all for joining us for our first High Impact Tea. We'll have other events. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to send it to us and we'll share it with Dr. Fisher to answer as well, if, if that's okay with you. And um, thank you so much for being here and giving us your time and, and just shedding a little bit of light on um, some of the innovation that's happening uh, in South LA um, for us to see in partnership with UCLA too, that you know many people may not be aware of. So thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here and all your thoughtful questions and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you.